And I'm grateful to everybody for taking the time out of their, everybody's busy life to come along this evening and uh, give me a little bit of your precious attention. I think there's never been such a hot competition for everybody's attention as there is these days, so I'm very grateful and humbled that you've chosen to come along to this evening and hopefully I'll be able to make it worth your while by giving you a few seeds or tidbits to run away with. So before we get on to the main subject matter tonight, I want to talk about just a few sort of like peripheral but very related things. And one of the things I want to talk about is uh, how excited or mentally excited everybody seems to be about this year. You know, there's, um, I think, and not just about this year, just in general, we are the most mentally stimulated generation of our species ever to have walked the planet. There's nobody that's been bombarded with as much mental information to process as you lot have, ever. The amount you get hammered with every day is more than people a few hundred years ago would have faced in their life. And it's something that deserves a bit of credit because um, we seem to have uh, kind of sacrificed without realising it some of the depth and substance of our life in favour of an excited but shallow buzz where we all know a little bit about everything and we end up becoming a bit of a know-it-all. And, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, we have become this culture of know-it-all awakened people who are all casually partying their way to their ascension in some way by, by some people. I'm not saying everybody is, but I'm just saying that there's an element of a current there. And I want to talk about it because everybody is reacting to stories that they've heard about the world and about themselves and about who they are and what they are. And maybe, maybe it's backed up by some experience or some insight that you yourself have had. But most people seem to be reacting to stories that they've picked up from somewhere else. And if we look at the stories that relate to this year and these times, they don't really get much bigger. Okay, they don't get much bigger than the stories of this particular year, do they? I mean, we're looking at the um, end of the Mayan calendar that a lot of people are getting all buzzed up about, which could be anything. We've got people who are expecting aliens who are benign and aliens who aren't benign. We've got people who are waiting for comets and solar flares. We've got folks who are waiting for systemic collapse and shutdown and, oh, I mean, the, the list goes on. And all of these stories are absolutely monumental because think about it, if any of them came to pass, if any of them, would life as we know it continue the next day? And the reality is for most of them, I think the answer is no. It would vary depending on whether we were looking at solar flares or aliens or ascension or whatever. But the reality is that they're massive stories that um, I know quite a lot of people who are basing their current decisions on those future stories. And so I know people who are saying, oh, well, you know, we've only got a few months to go or I'm not going to pay this because we only got till the end of this year and things like that. And uh, it's a real concern because if this happened in the year 2000, when everybody future loaded their awareness and their attention and their passions and sat about casually while lots and lots of months passed in the interim. And my concern is that why so many people are waiting for these exciting stories to manifest, that the erosion of our sort of community values and um, fundamental relationship interactions is continuing to be eroded at a large scale level. Now, what is great is to be able to come to a place like this and speak tonight. So I need to mention the venue. Obviously, you lot know where you are, but for the people who might be watching this film, they don't. And this place is called The College Project in Bristol. I didn't know about it before today. I've turned up and it's amazing. It's brilliant. It's a, bit of re it's a reclaimed college where there seems to be lots of art and talk spaces and stuff going on and people using the space. And this is um, an incredible example of where, you know, we're not buying into that old paradigm thinking. You do tend to find creative types will pave the way to the future, but obviously finding places like this can be difficult because obviously there's not a lot of money for marketing and to let people know. So please do check out the college project and other places like it because it's well worth supporting things like this because um, they very much demonstrate some of the future that some of us aspire to. And certainly um, for those of us in the interim, part of the focus of tonight's talk is to get us to make use of the time that we have before whichever our chosen story decides to land upon our laps and deliver us the glory that we've all been seeking. But until then, tonight is about how we can use the time in between effectively to revisit some of the things that may be neglected. And again, places like this college project are great for trying to get into the nitty gritty of, of what community actually is and how we can make it happen without requiring 
externally imposed structures. So, how do we get around this, this sort of this buzz, this excitement? Um, it's an interesting thing because um, most people go to the same place to get their buzz, to get their story, to get their fix. And what do we call it? Where do we go to get the internet? That's right. So as some of you know, I go on all the time about spells and words being spells and the impact of the ones that are staring us in the face. And I just invite you to consider that the two spells, that is the two words that we use to refer to that place where we go for our big story fix, are what are the words? The net and the web. Okay, let's just look at those words in a different context. The net and the web. Okay, who likes to think that they are the fisherman and the spider dancing out across the net or the web to get their, their hit? Well, you are up to a point until the point that you're no longer in control and you find yourself losing four hours looking at inane and nonsensical YouTube comments or something like that. Anyone find themselves doing that? Never. I've been there. The entertainment is endless, isn't it? <laughs> the banality is absolutely ceaseless. But this is part of the problem. This is part of the problem. As a species, we've never been presented with... I mean, we all take them for granted now, but computers are the most multifunctional tool humans have ever had placed at our disposal. Everything else is generally just for a few things. A screwdriver is for screws. You can't hammer things with it. A hammer's for nails. You can't screw things with it. Same with most of the tools that we're used to. But computers are something you can do a whole bunch of things with. You ever find yourself sitting in front of a computer going, what am I going to do? You know, just staring at the screen. You know, have you ever been there? Exactly, that's what I mean. And I think as a, we, we should recognise it and discuss it because it's a discipline that we have to learn. You know, it's a tool that's taking more of our time than it should do. And rather than being the fisherman and the spider, we become the fish and the fly. And we become jacked up on the story. We then vent our emotional content and our depth and our substance into it and then not go out and do stuff. Have you ever done that? Where you just feel better because the forum's got it all. It's like, oh, I feel better now. I feel like I've done my bit. You know, and actually that passion and that verve and that fire that you felt is actually spent. You've... You know, spent three hours crafting your post or whatever it is, or making your little video and sending it out there. And I'm not saying that's not a good thing. It obviously is. But I'm just suggesting we need to revisit the balance of these things and check in with our excitement fix and our story fix. Uh, because one of the common threads in all of these stories, every single one of them, from Benjamin Fulford to Ascension to Aliens to Comets to Solar Flares, is that you don't have to do anything. Every single one of them is about it being taken out of your hands and somebody else or something else taking care of it. And actually, this is actually, I discovered that uh, I stumbled upon this sort of, comp I named it, I worked a lot in mental health and I have a name for this complex and it's actually Messiah Complex. But it's the other side of Messiah Complex. We're all familiar with the first side of Messiah Complex where you've got people like David Icke or Bill Hicks or Terence Trent Darby who have had awakenings and actually renamed themselves the Messiah in one way or another, or thought that they were, or made the statement publicly that they were. That is the, the version that we're familiar with. The version we're not familiar with is the other side of Messiah complex, which is where we're waiting for someone else to do the work and save us. We're waiting for someone else to bail our community out. That is Messiah complex and is no different to walking about thinking that you're Jesus. It's no different, it's just the other side of the coin. One is the one thinking they're going to save, and the other one is waiting to be saved. And I just invite you to consider which one you might be, because one might be better than the other, I'm not sure, you know. Which is better, a whole bunch of people sitting about waiting for Jesus, or a whole bunch of people thinking they are him? You know, <laughs> you choose, you know. That's it, but it's a really interesting thing, and again, it really ties in to this net and web effect, because if we can go in there, and we get our high, and we get our fix, we can feel a little bit better up against the backdrop of all the other news, which, all these other stories, which are supposed to be enlightening and awakening, but can often have the hidden undercurrent that you might not consciously notice of making you feel powerless and helpless, or making you feel impotent and actually unable to do anything about it. And that is the double-edged sword of alternative media, where one side is like, yeah, all this truth, all this juice, you know, here we are, truth juice, you know, come and get your fix of a dose of truth. But it is a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, you can be like, did you know that they're doing this? Oh my goodness me, what an affront. We need to stop supporting corporate mayhem and destruction of the planet and do something else. So that's all right. That's the sort of the... Um, I totally lost my thread on that there. I just moved out of my space and left myself behind. Goodness me. 
Thank you, the double-edged sword, yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, I think you get the point on Messiah Complex. I don't think I need to belabor that point much, do I? But again, just to factor that in, in what we're covering tonight and how it applies to our lives. So mentally excited, we're all a bunch of mentally excited messiahs, either one side of the coin or the other. Um, my big concern about, again, about alternative media, I just want to talk a little bit more about it, is the, the ongoing double-edged sword side of it, which is there's another undercurrent to it. Not only is there the powerlessness of it, but there is the fact that it is somebody else's story of the world, not yours. Okay? And that's really important because if you consider yourself to be an awakened individual or if you've had any awakening experiences whatsoever, it is even more important what you think, what anybody else thinks. Because the power of your thought process and your co-creating power is worth 10 times some fluoridated McDonald's eating sheep out there. And it's a real concern of mine that all you great awakened folk are being exploited to tell somebody else's story of the world. And I'm worried about that. Because if all of the so-called awakened and energized and activist people are all repeating the same stories of horror, then I'm really worried. Because it doesn't matter really what 50,000 sedated, fluoridated people are thinking, not that much because they're being, you know, operating at such a low level and such a low vibration of thought process, we don't have to worry too much. But when you create bright sparks, you, you know, emancipated, liberated, energized love, when you start thinking all the dark thoughts and describing a dark future, I get worried because, um, you know, despite what you may be thinking about the positive side of your life, there's all the peripheral stuff that we unconsciously buy into, sure, you know, purely by our engagement with it. And I'm, what we're going to be looking at tonight in the balance of our authority, which is obviously the first word of tonight's talk, is actually how we can maintain the balance of being aware of what's going on, but without hopefully feeding it, making it worse, and adding to its manifestation. Because 12 people in a room, doesn't matter how nasty they are or how long their system has been affected, 12 people in a room cannot change the world by themselves. But if they get a whole bunch of other people to repeat their story of the world, it will become the manifest truth. So I just invite you to consider that as well as, we, as, we, as, as the future unfolds where more and more stories surround you. Because one thing is for sure, the stories are not going to get less dramatic. They're not. It's just not going to get less dramatic. They're not going to get smaller because that's not the way this mental excitement bubble works. It's going to go until it manifests or it pops. One of the two. That's it. So tonight is, is very much, the, all, the, all three elements I'm going to be looking at tonight are about how you can manage in amongst that. Because you're going to feel, you know, all those messages of oppression, control, whatever, are going to continue to come, and uh, we need to be ever more careful how we manage our space. Are you trying to sneak in here, small child of mine? Are you trying to crawl in under the radar? <laughs> Not unless you just walk up. Okay. So... What we're going to be, um, the last thing I want to say before we begin is, if we haven't already begun, is about this idea of truth. And the fact is that there's tons of truth out there. You can go on the net or the web and you can get, jack yourself up on as much truth as you like and read as much of it, watch as much of it as you like, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it can get you nowhere. Because just because something is true, it doesn't mean it's important. It doesn't mean it's relevant. I mean relevant to you and your future. And it doesn't mean it can take you anywhere. And I'm only interested, I've been surrounded by so much cack in my life, I'm only interested in that stuff which goes somewhere, it's important, it's relevant. Because I'm, you know, all of us are bombarded so much, surely we should start to have a bit of assertiveness over what we want to fill our minds and the spaces of that with, you know, and what stories we want to be repeating. And so I want to try and always use the time that I have with you, however short it is, to try and just stay on what's important and what's relevant. And tonight's distillation is, I think, very important and relevant for anybody not just interested in the sovereign or the free man movement, but anyone interested in finding out how they can move to express themselves more confidently and in a more empowered fashion in their life. Um, and I, it's, it's such an important point because I want everybody to just, it's such a cliche, but it's going to happen, so you better all do it. I want you to turn around and look at everybody in this room. You don't have to make eye contact, you don't have to do anything like that, you don't have to introduce yourself, I just want you to look. None of them bite. No, there's no monsters yet. It's all right. Okay. 
Did anybody see anybody that looked like them? Did you see anybody that looked like you? Hmm? No. Did you see anybody that dressed like you? No. No. So why is it we're all so transfixed on looking to others for some idea as to what our story might be, as to what our truth might be, as to what message we may have to bring? Because we all do it a little bit. That's part of that seeking aspect within us. But we're at a time now, I think, where it's a time for us to own it. I think we're going through a massive space initiation. I'm not going to talk about that just now, tonight. But, um, you know, a massive initiation of can you own your space? Can you, can you actually manage the integrity of your boundary? Uh, it's a very significant thing because for most of us, you've been confident enough to wear the clothes that you want for most of your life. You've been confident enough to wear your hair in the style that you want or have facial hair or not for the guys, whatever it is. But how many of us actually have the confidence to speak the truth of our unique interpretation of things? How many of us allow the truth of our being and our story or what we may have intuited or sensed in our life, how many of us allow that to spill over into the same visibility as our clothes and our hair? Because I think that's the challenge that's before us. And my concern is, as the so-called awakened and certainly the seekers who are here tonight and what, who may be watching, my concern is, is that if, you, if we cannot take that courageous manoeuvre to own our space and move beyond our individuality simply being a conversation amongst like-minded friends or having our unique choice of clothing, if we can't move beyond it and boldly own our space throughout the day on a daily basis, then I think we're screwed. And I think the responsibility lies equally in all of our hands. Because I can't be there in Bristol when, you know, the Bristol people need to feel a sense of community, but you guys are. And one of the things we're going to look at tonight is how much of a controlling hand all of us have in the levels of community and humanity that our fellow human beings experience on a daily basis. All of you hold an ace trump in that arena. And we're not aware of it because we're all waiting for somebody else to do it first. Or not all of us, but... You know, some of us. So please, nobody think I'm talking about you, but if you do feel like I'm talking about you, maybe there's something to look at. So, swiftly moving on, yeah. Uh, so, for those of you that know me from the Freeman and the Sovereign stuff, you might have heard of the People's Public Trust. I'll talk about that about at the end of tonight. Um, but through my work in that arena, I've been exposed to a lot of cases as in court cases or a lot of situations where people have challenged authority or have had encounters with so-called authority. And also just, you know, being, being in, um, you know, having taught and spoken in a number of different arenas for almost a decade now, I've encountered lots of avenues and areas of life where people are looking to find their power and express themselves. Everything from hippies to yogis to spiritual crowds to activists. You know, I've been around quite a few arenas of our culture and I've found a few common threads. And tonight is about the common threads because I've realised we can get rid of the situations and we can get rid of the methods that we're looking at and there's a few key points that are the same for all of us in any situation in terms of this desire to exercise our authority. Um, and that's what we're going to look at. So oh, authority is an interesting word because, I mean, those of you who are into sov the sovereign free man movement, you might have heard that, you know, it's about authorising. And authorising is about authoring. Um, now, authoring is what? It's writing, isn't it? So, the whole concept of authority is who is writing the story of the daily, daily world? Who is writing the story of daily conduct? Who is writing the story of daily guidelines? And the one that we're indoctrinated into is the one where you have no authority and you are taught from as young as four to pay attention and that everybody else is authority. That then means that when you are spat out into life, exercising your authority can be a very difficult thing because you've had years of conditioning saying you don't have any. So how do we reclaim the power to be the author of our life, to authorise, to give ourselves the authority to authorise? You're authorised, you know, do, is that what we need? Do we need somebody to say you're authorised to do what you need to do? Because some of us do feel that. One thing I noticed very much in the spiritual sort of healing movement was people who had, had awakenings to talents that they had but they still felt the need to go and get a certificate in something they didn't do, like Reiki or aromatherapy or something like that. Does anybody know people who have done that? And they've gone out and they've gone and tallied themselves up a whole tally of certificates. 
And it's all because they don't feel the courage and the confidence to say, I can authorize my own ability and maybe it doesn't have a name, but I'm still going to do it. Instead, we need to go to somebody else to give us a bit of paper so we can say, look, you know, they've said I'm good at this. I'm good at this. See, somebody else says I'm approved. I'm authorized. I'm sanctioned. And this is the power of spells. We're totally dependent on the piece of paper with the spells on it to give us the belief that what we have has value or that it has a, you know, a, a level of adeptness to it. I faced this a lot when um, I was looking at writing a book and it was so funny when, you know, if, somebody, if, if there was a book written by somebody with three letters after their name, it would get more credit and more sort of, um, you know, more distribution than somebody writing a similar book, but without, with only their life experience. And it's like, well, why, why is this? And it's all because of authorizing authority and this sort of a uh, mutual appreciation society of maintaining things as they are. Um, and this is the big challenge we're up against, which is the illusion of our desire for change. Where part of us states all the time, we want to change and we'll have these big aspirations. But if we look at the reality of how much of our deeply ingrained habits we've managed to change, for a lot of us, there's still quite a lot on the list. And I found this really interesting thread that came from that because when I, you know, I've been hearing all these cases and people phoning me up and sending me emails and sending me letters, describing their cases, describing their situations. And I, I had this epiphany moment when I, I realized there was a distilled similarity. And the message was, authority is not listening to me. Okay, the authority out there in the world is not listening to me. When I'm encountering my policeman or my council staff or my corporate service provider, they don't appear to be listening to me. Um, and I considered it and I pondered it. And then I had this, this little brain, brain flash moment where I realized, if you look at what you have learned in the last five or 10 years, and I'm only co co talking about the stuff that you think is important and relevant, okay? Forget the rest. I'm only talking about the stuff you think is important and relevant, the stuff that has really impacted you and you know you need to act on. And now I want to know how much have you actually implemented into your daily routine? Honestly, let's just be mature about it and be honest as a bunch of casual fellow journeyers on the, on the road. It's not 50%, is it? Well, for most of us, we'll be lucky if it's 20 or even 10. We're very good at referring to it and talking to it or having our little magical moments of it. But in terms of a sustained application, we have not managed to meet our own aspirations. What that translates to is that your internal authority is not listening to your aspirations, inspirations, motivations. The authority that you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with, that governs your daily perambulations and reaching out and clutchings in the world for whatever they might be, that is not listening. That's what it means. Now, here's the irony. The irony is, there we are, an authority that we spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with, we can't get it to listen to us, but we stamp our feet like petulant kids when an authority we encounter for 15 minutes, once every couple of months, doesn't listen to us. Does everyone see the somewhat irony, somewhat arrogance, somewhat naivety of that situation? Do we believe that we're co-creators of our reality? Does anybody believe that here or think that? Yeah. I think most of us will have had some evidence in the last couple of years that manifestation can just kind of happen sometimes, can't it? Things can just appear or disappear. Have you noticed that? It's an amazing thing. So then it makes it even more important, doesn't it, that what we think about we have to be really careful with, super careful with. So the problem that we then have is, well, surely you would think the things that you're most aspirational about and that you're most interested in, surely that should be straightforward enough to implement into daily routine. But it's not, is it? Has anybody tried it with something in their life that they want to change they wanted to make, but it didn't quite pan out? Now, the funny thing is, is he, that'll happen to all of us. Uh? Yes. <laughs> That'll happen to all of us. And the biggest mistake that we all make is to just continue with the relapse, if you know what I mean. That we don't just keep going up against it again and again and again and again. 
don't, don't get me wrong, in some things that we do, but in others that we don't. And the reason I mention it is because I think what's needed beyond anything is like, I've been doing these events for like seven or eight years now, and I'm constantly hearing people saying, we need more people. We need to get more people in these rooms. We need to do this event again, but get more people. Let's do it again next month, and I'll bring some people, and let's get more people. We need to get more people awakened. And what I've learned, what I've kind of realized, and what I think is, I don't think that's true. I'm not convinced it's true at all. I actually think the people that do know and that have awakened to it need to bloody well act on it. That's the problem. I don't think we need more people. The funny thing is, I really do believe, and it's an, and not just belief, I do, other, I do loads of events, as some of you know, but a lot of them are about not just social evolution, which is really what I classify this sort of subject as, but also stuff about personal development and other issues going on on a planetary level. And I find it, um, you know, I do have this belief that there's, or this idea that there's only one human on the planet and we're all like cells of that human. We're cells of an agency on this planet. And uh, even though we like to group, the reality is we do all have an individual story and an individual tale to tell and that means an individual role to play out and if you look at the cells in your body it's always a great example you know we're built up in a, in a mirror of that and if you look at your body no two cells are the same the brain doesn't stand there having a go at the heart for doing a crap job all the time and the liver isn't poking fun at the kidneys but we do that to each other don't we we have this thing where we finger point we measure and we do all this sort of stuff now I lost my thread there talking about the body. I'm going to pop quiz now. Where was I before I deviated onto that? We need to act. That was a good summation there, but more than that, I need more to... Looking at each other and sort of accusing each other of things unlike the body. No. More people. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. The more people thing. Okay. So... Yeah, it is. It is a Scottish thing, absolutely. It's genetic alcohol issues. <laughs> um, so uh, just for a second now, um, I'd like you all just to lift up your left hand for me. Okay. And now I want you to put it down. Okay. Did anybody, can anybody tell me how they did it? Okay. Does your hand understand what you're asking it to do, or does it just do it? So why do we think every single human being needs to understand what needs to be done? What percentage of your total makeup understands? 15% of your total cellular makeup? If that. I'm suggesting the same might be true for our species as a whole. And perhaps what we need to learn is how to create movement. Because what's interesting is we don't know how we move our hand, we just do it. And if we can re-enter that part of our awareness that got us to that position of moving hands, maybe we can bring about the changes that we need. But the reason I mention it is I don't think we need to get every human being on the planet to understand what's going on. But I do think the ones that do know, we need to get better at acting on what we know. And I'm not suggesting it's easy at all. I've not done it. <coughs> I'm still wrestling through it. But this is the point is, I think we need to enter a level of maturity over the honesty of the story bubbles that we tell about ourselves. Because this brings me on to the sort of the second point. So I'm going to write authority up because we're going to keep revisiting these three words tonight as a, a nice, simple thing. So the first one is authority. Okay. So... <coughs> One of the things that I liked about the Sovereign and the Free Man movement <coughs> when I first encountered it was that I saw people facing <coughs> the challenges of their personal power, the challenges of their self-expression based on their belief, what they believe to be true in a often, sometimes selfish, but often altruistic perspective. And they were going up against authority and it became initially this petulant foot stamping. There was a lot of that going on. <coughs> a lot of anger and um, over time <coughs> excuse me I realized that um, or as I was watching it <coughs> I saw that people were wanting methods and templates and things like that and you could see countless <coughs> well not countless but loads of people 
all trying the same method, but everybody getting a different response. Everybody having a different effect. <coughs> for some people they were effective, for others they weren't. And uh, I found there was a common thread amongst all the people who were effective in the sovereign and free man movement. A common thread amongst every one of them. And it had nothing to do with their method, no matter what any of them will tell you. Um, what it had everything to do with was their ability to connect to the human being. Their ability to connect to the humanity in another person so that that person would put the role down, the role that they were standing in. Because that's what you're up against at first, a person, and there's a role standing between them. And I saw that all these people, regardless of the method they used, they were able to connect to the human being behind them. And that was the tempering force. Because otherwise, authority unchecked became just as bullying in the other direction. So yeah, you had people who were feeling that they'd been bullied by authority most of their life. And as they were finding their own authority, they were becoming the bully. The only people that weren't were the ones who were tempering it with their humanity, which is the second word I'm going to write on the board. Because what's really, there's a really interesting thing about this humanity thing, because um, how many people here think they're, you know, fairly humane individual, you know, you, you kind of, you're not going out to hurt anybody, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I would say, you all are pretty humane individuals for me, you know. But there's this, again, the story that we describe of ourselves is perhaps not as honest as we would like to believe. And that's what I want to consider tonight because I'm going to make an observation. It can't be an observation because I don't know most of you. So call it an accusation if you like. Um, obviously meant in the nicest possible way and not intended to affect your internal state at all. But I'm going to suggest that every one of you drip feeds your humanity on a daily basis. You drip feed it. So what I mean by that is that in amongst a group of like-minded people like this, you'll be nice as pie, happy smiley, happy to share your deepest thoughts and concerns or whatever that might be. But there's other situations where you won't. And what I'm going to suggest is that actually for each of us, we have a different persona we present in numerous situations in life. So there's, there might, no, not everybody, because most of, a lot, everybody in the path of awakening looks to break down these barriers between the aspects of our life. But for most of us, there's still, and as we are around our parents to some extent, and as we are around our loved one or friends, the, the us that we are at work, the us that we are as we're walking down the street, the us that we are when we are in the shops, and various things like that. And so now I do just, just invite you to consider, do you actually... Um, have the same level of humanity in all of those situations. We don't, do we? And it's an interesting point because the second thing, distillation that I got from all of these people in the free man and the sovereign movement, is the distillation that's been happening, wasn't just that authority wasn't listening. The second thing I heard and distilled was, I'm having a less humane experience. People were saying, I'm having a less humane experience from my service providers, my corporate entities, the police in the street, the council staff. It's less humane. And I'm not happy about it. You know, I want you to treat me like a human being and not a number and all the rest of it. But then if we revisit the whole thing about drip feeding humanity, my question is, where, who, who, with, who withheld humanity first? Was it the service providers or was it us? And then who is the responsible? But I think it's a chicken and egg. I see you eyeing that up there. Exactly. Because I think it's chicken and egg. I don't think... I don't think we'll, we'll be able to backtrack that and work it out. But I do, I am willing to suggest that if we're willing to suggest that we're co-creators in our reality, which most of you did put your hands up to, then I wonder whether we are the agents of our own inhumanity or the agents of our own inhumane experience. And that we are mirroring and building a mirror of authority not listening and inhumanity. And it's terrifying because it is getting worse in that respect. And when you're in situations with people, I've been in many situations where it's just, it just isn't simple. It just isn't simple, you know. Um, you've got to be able to look at things from other people's points of view. I, I, we have, I've been at a number of festivals recently where people were moaning about the security and the security guards influence, you know, affecting their, their sovereign rights to carry a bottle of glass and blah, 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 or whatever it might be, and how bullshit the guards were with them or the security were with them. 
And it was like, well, actually, you were speaking to that security guard at 10 o'clock at night, you were probably being a bit foot stampy, and you know, you're probably the 5,000th person that day that tried to exert their freedom and sovereignty. Give your brother a break, you know. How would you feel in that situation? And it's interesting how we, we choose when we want to feel powerful, or we choose when we want to make a point. And I just wonder how often we're, you know, there's, there's how much of it is, is ego at play or how much of it is picking the wrong target. You know, it's a lot of ego. At this festival, I, I, we had a free man forum on the Saturday night and I couldn't believe how bothered people were about the fact that they'd had to pay to go to the festival, uh, which I'm going to get on to later on, and that they had to, um, and that they had to uh, obey the rules. And I thought it was so funny because we, the, the, it was people who clearly, you know, were, were confident of their own ability to respond and confident of their own containment of what they are and all the rest of it. But it was like, but you're, you're projecting and expecting everybody else to be able to live to those standards. And I mean, the exa- one of the examples that came up was glass. And it was like, for me, it, it was like, have you ever been to, say, Stonehenge on a solstice or something like that? Or have you been to a festival where there is glass in the field? Have you ever tried to pick up all the glass from one broken bottle in a muddy field? Do you know how long it takes? And if not, who are you leaving it for to stand on? It's just a silly thing where it's like, well, look, if we all agree, we'll just put all our booze in a plastic container and go in, then we don't have to worry about that. And yet people take it personally, as a personal affront, that they have been denied their sovereign right to carry a glass bottle when they're not looking at the bigger picture. And it's me, me, me. And what I got about the Freely thing is really interesting because it was funny how when you were picking apart the idea of the free festival, what it meant was people wanted to come along to a festival for free where other people had invested their resources, time and money in tents, in food, in bits and bobs, in coming early to set up, in giving their time to stand behind the counter for 12 hours a day, in all that stuff. So they wanted them to pay so that the festival could be enjoyed freely by that other party. And I'm like, look, Sorry, if all you are bringing is your wallet, then be prepared to use it. Do you see the point? If you're not going to bring your... Don't, don't bring your wallet. I didn't pay to come here. I don't pay to, to go to those events because I bring something else. If you want a free festival, that's how to do it. And there's loads of opportunities for stewarding and all the rest of it at festivals, but I'm using it as an example of where we often pick completely the wrong targets to exercise our authority. And we end up becoming the agents of inhumanity. And then... We're wondering why next year that security guard is even more bitter and angry than he was last year. It's like, well, because he's had five, you know, 5,000 so-called awakened people choosing him as being the agent of their expression of their authority because they're too afraid to do it at the council offices. Or they're too afraid to do it in front of a uniform. And say, so, well, actually, your authority is really that big then, isn't it? In fact, it's smaller than that. It's that big. Because you're choosing easy targets. You're choosing people that can't fight back. Or the worst thing is in security guards, when they choose to fight back, it gets messy. You know, that's the problem. And then everybody then gets upset about security, don't they? So I'm only using that as a live example because it was something that came up very recently at two festivals that I was at. And it's a common thread at a number of them. And so people are obviously going there because they want to let their hair down because they believe they're away from authority. And it's the wrong place. It's like people also want to go away to experience humanity. Or they want to go away to experience community. Let's go and live in community somewhere. We want to go and buy some land and live in community. I said, well, what's outside your door? What is it that's outside there right now? Because the whole point of tonight's talk is, if you remember the stories I mentioned at the beginning, my concern is that for every single one of those stories, comets, ascension, aliens, blah, blah, bombs, you know, whatever, most of them will involve some kind of systemic shutdown. Where? The net and the web may not be there for you. And so who is going to be there? Is it going to be your codenamed buddy from the forum that you've got all cosy and pally-pally with over the last couple of years but lives in Botswana? <laughs> it's not going to be them, is it? Instead, it is going to be the people outside the front door. And I just invite people to consider how, how are you going to feel in that situation? So just say it has happened. Whichever story bubble you want, it popped. You know, we can all give a round of applause at being right that the system was rubbish and we let it fail and we all stood there. Yes, it, we were right, we were right. Bugger, there's no food. Oh no, there's no petrol, there's no electricity. Oh my goodness, you know. And the people really haven't thought it through for a lot of their story buzz. 
And I'm not, I'm certainly not, and I am not uh, uh, an agent of doom and fear in that respect. I'm not suggesting anybody go out and stock up on food or anything like that. But what I am suggesting is to enter into that sense of feeling as, how will you feel? Because if you'll feel okay and you're all right talking to your neighbours, then cool. But I know a lot of people, especially in urban zones, um, that don't feel that strong and confident about it. And in actual fact, they would feel very small and very fearful in that sort of situation. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people like that, especially in cities. And what I'm going, what the, the whole point of tonight is to get us to a point where we can feel armed to um, create situations for ourselves which will allow us a measured and managed growth so that if those stories do pop, we didn't sit back and just wait for story fixes. We prepared ourselves so that our internal integrity could withstand that sort of challenge. Which is very much about these two things checking off each other. Because what's interesting is, if your authority can be tempered with your humanity and be motivated by it, you arrive at the third word of tonight's talk, which is, the result is community anyway. It is community. Because another little distillation that I'd noticed was, I've been around quite a few communities, communities in this country where they've gone off to go and live in community. And it's so funny because very few of them make it long term. And even the ones that have lasted a while, what it's, it's, it's almost sadly hilarious that they're falling into all the same old traps of the existing culture. So they've gone away and they've ended up with bitterness, backstabbing, hierarchies, rules, regs, all the rest of it, and all the stuff they were trying to get away from. And I kind of realized why it is. And it's because people do stuff with people they like. And it's dependent on liking. We have to get away from our dependency on liking because that's not how a community's needs get met. If you look at what happens in a community where people say, well, here's all my buddies that we like. And we're all going to go and live in community. We've picked our land. It's great. We've divvied it up. We've built our houses. Brilliant. But something happens when people work together and when they are in each other's space a lot. And when they're in each other's space a lot, exactly, tension happens. Tension builds. And if you've not got the structures in place to deal with it, and I don't mean talking sticks, okay? That's not it. <laughs> you know, it's not. I, I wish, for goodness sake, can we please evolve beyond the talking stick? Please, universe, honestly, humanity, if we still require a stick to get anywhere <laughs> and a conversation, then we are woefully, woefully less developed than we'd like to fantasize that we are, what really. Hat? Sorry? More entertainment <laughs> value. I'd be well up for a talking hat, yeah. Just purely because it would put it on the right level where it deserves to be. And no shaking hands. Yeah. Yeah, no, no enforced buddyship. Yes. Yeah, because it's a playing to a lie. It's tomfoolery, isn't it? It's absolute nonsense. We have this, this inf you know, there's this, I don't know where it's come from. I don't know who it came from, but they do need a bit of a kidney dig. Yeah. But somebody gave the impression that humans should all, uh, that, that, that the concept of unity translates to we all like each other. Did anyone come across that concept? Unspoken. It's unspokenly there. The, the unity means that we all like each other, we all get along, we're all one big happy family. It's not the case. Are all foxes one big happy family? Are all wolves one big happy family? None of the mammals are all one big happy family. Why are we any different? Of course we're not, but we're, we're trying to create an unrealistic, an unrealistic modality on ourselves. And they, these communities are the, are the evidence that it can't work. Because they've shown that we have not yet built the correct structures to handle our human foible. The foibles of the stuff that we don't understand about ourselves. The fact that we're not all masters of our emotional and mental expression. We've not factored that in. The talking stick doesn't cut it because people go away after a talking stick session. That's not it, is it? So this is, I mean, a lot of the events that I do, other than this, the workshoppy ones, are about giving and taking space. But certainly, I think the theme for this year, for us as a species, is about giving and taking space. Giving people the space to be where they're at and to be, have whatever imperfect foibles that they do without taking it personally. But owning your own and owning where you're at as well. And if we can get into a space of that sort of 
not leaning on each other and not letting others lean on us, then we're in with a chance of hitting the start point. And the start point is when each of us own the uniqueness of our contribution, that we can exercise authority tempered by humanity to arrive at community. Because this is the point, because the reality is the new community is not something that we've ever had. It's an idealism that isn't mapped out, isn't it? We all have our own sense of it, our own feeling of it, but has anybody ever sat down and done a bullet point list of what community means to them? Have you ever sat down and done a bullet list point of what you would like to, how you would like to see yourself in a few years' time? I've never either, you know. I'm not suggesting that we should, you know, and, and I'm not, but I'm only mentioning it because we've got to acknowledge where we're a bit nebulous and where we're a bit woolly. And actually sometimes in some situations, let's just be mature about it and nail it down a bit clearer. Get rid of the assumptions, get rid of the ambiguities, make it all a little bit clearer. Give people the respect for maybe being in a different place from where you are, you know. How many times have you been in situations where the whole point's been lost because somebody else thought they were there for something completely different? Or they thought you were talking about something completely different? And how, how often do we check that we've actually got, you know, shared the right point? It's a really funny thing, how much is actually assumed and ambiguous and all the rest of it. So, I kind of, I don't really know what else can be done in terms of what, what, what would be needed to be the appropriate kick up the backside to implement the changes that we need to make. And I'm saying this speaking to myself as well. It's like, am I going to need somebody to drop a big fat bomb on my neighbours? Am I going to need to wait for... This is what I think. This is what I think. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree, Will. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I'm inclined to agree only because if we look at the trends in our life, that, that would actually be an exact mirror. Because how many of us pay attention the first time we get a lesson delivered to us? We don't. We wait until it's really, really bloody uncomfortable, don't we? Or we wait until it's like the fifth relationship where it's like, right, this is happening again. Am I going to own this or what? You know, or whatever. But we generally wait. Sorry? Well, that's, yeah. That community where people came together, doesn't matter yeah. from what community they were, from rich or poor. Exactly. Dig each other out, help each other. Exactly, exactly. An incredible thing. And I really don't want <coughs> for that to be the case. I really, really don't. And uh, that's why, I mean, I'll get on to the People's Public Trust at the end, but really, the point of all of this is because I am desperate for you guys to tell your story. I'm not interested in you thinking anybody else's story of the world. I want to hear yours. I don't care how mad it is. I don't care what planet you think you came from. I don't care what universe it is. I don't care what fairy kingdom you're in touch with. I don't care what art you do. I don't give a monkeys. I really don't. I just want it to be yours. That's it. I just want it to be yours. I want to hear that. That's it. I want you to live that. And I want to empower that wherever possible. And I'm not interested in anything else because if we can't do it, then it's going to be the big, big, the next big bang. Is because there's no choice. I, I've been, I've been had quite an interest in the. I saw at the beginning of the year there was a massive investment in geoengineering. Some of you call them chemtrails. I just want to say I hate the term chemtrails. I never use them. I only use them so that people can draw the link between that and geoengineering. Don't go searching for chemtrails. Go searching on Google for geoengineering and find out how much money and time has been poured into it in this country. It's now mentioned on the Parliament's website. The Guardian have a regular page. The Independent have a regular page. There's talk of regulation on the Parliament's website because it's happening and they don't know who's doing it and they don't know why and they don't know how to manage it. And I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I've been watching it. I want to do a talk on it in a bit because I've got loads of photos and videos of geoengineering is conscious weather modification to reverse assumed man-made weather change. And there's two strategies being used in this country. Again, you can read about it on the Parliament's website. I'm not making it up. It's not a conspiracy. If anybody thinks it is, please step outside so I can stamp on your head a few times <laughs> because I'm not making it up. Um, I've now got my mum mentioning this on her Facebook page because she got the source off the Parliament's website. The point is, there's maniacs out there 
who, because they spend most of their life in a lab, think the way to cool the planet is actually to block the sun. And what they're doing is a lot of these high wispy cloud layers you're seeing being laid are what's called SRM, and it's solar radiation management. And so these cold days that you're getting that are a bit too cold for June have been because of some of the chemicals they're laying to try and cool things down because of how intense the planet is being impacted by solar rays. I just want to say something about solar rays for a moment. Seems a bit unrelated, but it's very related. Does everybody here understand that the heat you feel from the sun is not thermal? And by that I mean it's not like standing around a fire where you go, ooh, toasty. The tingle you feel on the skin may feel the same, but it's not the same. Space is cold. If the sun was like a fire, space would all be warm, wouldn't it? But it's not. So we need to pay attention to the fact that these rays that are coming from the sun are destined for us. They're meant to be landing. They're not meant to be getting deflected. They're meant to be heading every, every life form on this planet. And if you look at the amount of geoengineering that goes on, it is absolutely astronomical. It's incredible. Bill Gates put billions into it at the beginning of the year when he also invested in the mass vaccination program in uh, Africa. Um, and that's what's seen some of the massive going, goings on of it this year. And I'll tell you what, that really got my attention because I was watching this going on. I started to mention it a little bit just to always, you know, always, you know just sensing people out. And the number of people that were unwilling to pay attention to their own sensory information based on their own life experience and instead needed to read somebody else's spells to get a gist of it, that terrified me more than anything else about our sense of hope. And up until the last six months where um, this has been going on large scale, I'd always been overwhelmed with the hope and absolutism of our humane victory. But to see the ongoing apathy in response to the madness that's being dropped on our heads, it's like, okay, you can avoid the water and filter away. You can avoid the toxic chemical food and go and grow your own produce. But you don't know what's spraying from the sky. You don't know what's landing on your so-called organic produce. You can't stop breathing it in. And, uh, you know, this is what I've got just now is so-called hay fever. I don't know what it is. I'm coughing and I'm spluttering. I feel like I've got glass in my chest. I don't know what it is. I've, I've, I've never had hay fever like this before. But it's arrived. It could be pollen. It could be something else. How am I meant to know? But my concern was off the back of that, just watching the ongoing apathy and the return to the story fix, the return to the story bubble. It's all right, we've only got a few more months to wait. I started to curse and think, do you know what? Oh dear. And then when people came to me and they said, what should we do? What can we do? I'm getting to the stage where all I can say is pray. Because the ongoing apathy in response to the level of stimulation, where it's not just in your face in the food, it's in your face in the sky every day. And we still are not moved to act. Then we just got to wait to see which story decides to manifest, which one pops and what happens. But again, the onus is on the so-called awakened because <laughs> I think they can divert from that path. They are a responsible and accountable and capable of, between us, engineering a smooth transition and engineering a smooth sort of journey. But only if we can claim these three things. And the number one thing is, first of all, the authority of your, your life is authorised, OK? So you're, the, you're, the act of your birth was your authority. That's the point. The fact that you made it through that initiation of arriving here means that you are as divinely mandated as anybody or anything else. You're already authorised. When are you going to own it? Enough. Now, to temper that with the humanity, that's the, a really interesting one because of how much power we each have on a daily basis to bring more humanity to the people around us. Because let's really look at how we are in the shop queue or how we are walking down the street or how we are with our neighbours that have just moved in from Poland. Because, what's it, I mean, there's this thing, the Mongols call, call this thing, they've got this thing they call the cold face. And uh, it's from their kids growing up, so that they could meet other tribes and not give away how they felt. And so they would train the cold face in kids by taking them to glacial rivers that were freezing cold and have them sit in it until they were blue and passing out. But it was so that they would learn to not show 
how they were feeling in response to that cold. So it was called the cold phase because they could handle absolute freezing cold glacial waters and show nothing. We have our own version of the cold face in our culture, walking down the street, don't we? We give away nothing in red. We don't engage in... London's the best example because, has anyone noticed, they haven't got it written as a bylaw as you enter London, but I think they should for visitors, that it's illegal to look anybody in the eyes in London. You're not allowed to make eye contact in London, and if you do, then woe betide you. Has anyone encountered that? Any Londoners here? You're a Londoner. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I know you don't. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the point. I mean, I would, ex yeah, I would expect the people here to have already begun this journey and this challenge. But the point is, is to be able to give you this distillation just so you can clarify the situations that we're up against. Because we can see that in, in certain situations, maybe a bit more authority is required. In other situations, maybe a bit more humanity is required. And for us to have that distillation to refer to, again, because I'm not thinking any of you haven't come across these issues, and I'm not saying you are the Londoner, you know, no, no eye contact person, but just interesting to be aware of it. And so the suggestion is obviously in our daily life to just be aware. Don't give yourself too big a challenge, you know. Be aware of where we're doing it. Watch yourself for a while. Because remember, we're studying an authority that you're with 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that hasn't been listening to your multiple years of aspirations and hope. Perhaps we need a different strategy to get it to listen. So that's what we'll look at after our break. So if we have a break for a brew and uh, whatever you want. And uh, thank you for your time. Okay, um, if it's a moment for announcements, then I suppose I should make an announcement as well. Um, and partly uh, to further the spread of this, I was going to mention the People's Public Trust as well. I will get on to it. It is a method, for those of you that don't know, that you can use to exercise authority and humanity in relation to public servants and things like that. Um, but what we have done is uh, we've now committed to uh, spreading not just this message but other, the other numerous messages that I would like to share with people and the tools to empower you. Um, we now live in our bus. So we are uh, available and ready to move around the country wherever we are needed. So the bottom line is if people want to have events, workshops, classes, whatever, all you have to do is help chuck the go-go juice in the bus and uh, help out with the old uh, feeding of the family and it's happy days, you know, that's the whole point, is to be available to meet the need. So anyway, moving on from that, and first I have to say it's, it's great, but still, massive learning curve. Anyway, right, um, so I know I, I mentioned a little bit about the geoengineering there before the break, um, because it's a, it's a live example. Um, and it created quite a bit of a discussion in the break there, which shows that people are aware of it and concerned about it. But again, we're not really left in positions of power, are we, in terms of what to do about it? Um, but I think we have to revisit this idea of uh, us being the agents of the story in the world and us being the, the co-contributors of the tale that is unfolding. And uh, somebody mentioned during the break that, you know, do you know why they're doing it? Do you know why they're doing it? And he said, uh, because they're afraid of the light. And it's a very, very valid point. That's why I made the point about it not being thermal light that's coming out. Um, and one thing that is often forgotten in people's anger at the estate and the establishment is why it is there and what it is for. The word we have for it is the state. Okay? And a state has been created as the comforter of our insecurity. The part of us that does not like change, the part of us that does want things to be the same, the part of us that does want routine and regularity, and we have to accept that part of us exists. Because if we don't move to meet its needs in other ways, we will continue to be reliant on state structures because of that reliability. Because the funny thing is that he was, you know, you're absolutely right, sir, that one of the reasons why it's going on is because in terms of the changes, in terms of the intensity of the sun and where we are in the universe at the moment and, you know, we've never been here before, all that sort of stuff. So while it may look like the Earth is continuing to orbit around the sun, the sun is also moving through space, which means we're in a different part of space. Everything could be different and we're just not giving it credit. Instead, 
We're getting the fingers pointed at us for breathing out too much and cows for farting too much and things like that. And that's being blamed as the source of all this stuff. But the point is, I, when I had that realization and I was watching these trails across the sky, I realized that it was panic. That it was brothers and sisters who were in a situation where their role was to maintain continuity and familiarity for our insecurity. And they were panicking because they're unable to do it in the face of the changes that are coming. And that's why their behavior will get more intense. Just like for us, as we move to making promises to ourselves or statements to ourselves about the changes that we would like to make, generally, when you say to yourself you want to stop smoking, you smoke a bit more for a while. You smoke more heavier. That part of you that likes to smoke says, well, I better get them in now before I stop. That's it, you know, I've only got a little bit of time left. I better just chung them all in or drinking, or whatever it is, whatever the statement is, oh, I'm going to give up chocolate next week, I better have five bars now, you know? <laughs> whatever it may be, where we make those sort of, place those conditions on ourselves for bringing about change. Um, but it's just funny to look at it in a different light and to perhaps take it less personally and less cynically and less sort of um, absolutely as some they thing. Whereas instead if we own it and say, well actually, how many people in here are smokers? Okay, there's a few. What I find really interesting, and I only mention it because it's actually a really interesting point, and uh, it's not one that I'm comfortable making, but as I've been watching these uh, traily things, these smoky trails blocking out the light, I have wondered as to the number of so-called awakened people who still cling to their smoking indulgence, and wonder how much of us are the agents of the blocking of the light by filling our airspace with smoke, and that this is merely the mirror of it. And uh, that, is a, that was a painful pill for me to swallow when I was looking at that with my pipe in my hand. <laughs> I'll tell you that, but oh, it isn't... Is... Yeah, well, the point is, I'm trying to pay... Didn't I say who people who want to cut through at the point a bit of a dose of the real? I'm just chucking an idea out there to say, well, you're an intelligent being. If you're believing it, how, how your understanding of mirror magic works might be different from mine. I'm just putting it out there. You might be able to completely disown it and affirm to yourself that... You're not in any way an agent of that, but in other ways, I can't help looking at it thinking, yeah, maybe, just maybe, I might need to own that one, damn it. You know, it's not nice. It's not meant to be nice for us to own these things because we like to tell the story of what I call our forward face. So we like to tell the story of our best face forward and perhaps not tell the story of what happens in the moments between moments, you know, in the little subconscious moments between the conscious moments. So the things we do by ourselves and the little habits we engage in and all these different things that we have to manage in the moments, between the moments that we share with our fellow brothers and sisters. And it's a really interesting thing to just say, well, how honest and mature can you be about it? And I'm just leaving it at that. You know, because again, you have to own this and this, not me. All I can do is perhaps hopefully poke a few prods and press a few theoretically uncomfortable buttons to hopefully trigger some thought. So anyway... Well, yeah, there's another one, isn't there? Part of the... No, no, but probably got a lot more to do with the increase in temperature than anything else is all these fires burning all day, every day that never burned before. You know, billions of cars, billions of central heating systems, billions of all these things, all producing heat. And, uh, you know, something else is getting the blame. Exactly, which then get warm because I try to keep things cool. It's so funny, this whole Babylonian civilization of fire, because everything is dependent on fire. Even the Babylonians even use fire to keep things cold. That's how fire dependent they are. That's amazing. It's actually amazing. It's an amazing mastery of fire that our civilization has uh, managed to achieve because we're utterly fire dependent. Utterly. Our electricity comes from fire. Our fridges come from fire, which is from the electric. You know, all of it is fire dependent. It's a very, very interesting thing. Anyway, that's another conversation. Um, my kind of, ch the challenge out of this one is obviously about this. How do we arrive at this community thing? Obviously, there's the authority, there's the humanity. But um, there's like perhaps accepting the mirrors that are in the world that we might not like to face, but accept them and own them. And even if you don't want to, just maybe ask, ask the question of yourself. That would be a, just at least a step one. Um, and also to maybe get a sense of this idea of the state as being agents of our insecurity because the reason the state is so powerful is because our insecurity is so powerful. Our vulnerability is immensely powerful. Our fragility is immensely powerful. That's where most of our 
our kind of um, persona comes from, is to shield that vulnerability and that fragility. And we can't own our space and own the truth of our own story without being a bit vulnerable and a bit fragile, because it's the truth. You know, if you come up and you stick something sharp in me, I'm going to cut and bleed. That's pretty vulnerable. You know, I can, I can admit it. But where can we admit it in other areas? Because we will not be able to release our dependency on the state and state structures until we are okay with our own insecurities. Again, looking at working with that mirror magic in the proper way. So, um, there's a whole number of, of, of things that I could talk about, but there's one I want to pick on, and that is um, the idea of the free society as being the new community. You know, the new community is being gift or free-based. Have people come across that idea before? Yeah, there's a lot of aspiration towards it, isn't it? And a lot of promises being made by people who are promising community solutions will, will be free or Skillshare based. It would be very difficult to make that work if any of us actually think it through properly for it to be complete. Very difficult. It's a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a bit of an ideology, really. A bit of a, a bit of a fantasy in a way. Not because it's not achievable, but because we're not looking at the steps required to achieve it. And it's a bit like climbing the steps to climbing the stairs to the first floor. And to think that we can jump to freeness of things now is like jumping to the top of a flight of stairs without understanding there are steps in between. So, for example, I mentioned the example of the free festivals earlier where people were talking about, yeah, it's a free festival. It's like, but wait a minute. Who paid for the fuel to bring the tents there? Who bought the tent? Who put the decorations on it? All the rest of it. Somebody paid. Okay, and I'll tell you what, I'm really, really... Uh, passionate about this because it directly affects me and my lifestyle and what I've chosen to do and that is that I've had so many people who have uh, ex expressed great desire to come to workshops and events of mine but as soon as there's any price tag attached even when there's freely discussable concessions available it's all, it's all of a sudden you know and people don't want to necessarily dip too deeply into their pockets for things now, I understand that because I'm in a position of a budget with a family and stuff like that as well. But what we're missing, again, is we're missing the message here. Because what we are saying is that the people who are bringing the message we want to hear or the things that we want to see in the community of our future are not worth paying for. They're not worth investing in. Those people that are bringing the future I want, they're not worth investing in. The ideas that are coming, they're not worth paying for. No, we don't want to talk about that. No, no, no. That should be for free. Meanwhile, every penny that gets earned is spent maintaining the old system. And it's like you lunatics, you hypocritical lunatics. And I hold my hands up as being partly one of them, but not now because in the last few months I've really got into this idea because I didn't give a talk, it was Truth Juice Nottingham actually, a number of months ago, and I watched, as I was going through Nottingham Town City Centre, I watched a lot of uh, people wearing brands, you know, big brands on their chest, you know, these big expensive brands. And I watched them going into their Tesco's and their Primarks and things like that. And I'd had a conversation with somebody about the whole necessary evil of things like that in the interim. So we have people where it's like, oh, well, I buy everything that I can at the community shop, but I still go and get X, Y, and Z from Tesco. It's a bit of a necessary evil to get that thing. And I'm like, well, as long as we continue to sanction necessary evil, then there will be evil because we're sanctioning it. And what's interesting is that it's just a small sacrifice that would normally be uh, re required. But what really got me was I was watching these people who were generally working class, generally not wealthy, but wearing things to make them appear wealthy, the status chase. But what I saw was them going into Primark and whatever, and here they were with a small amount of power, the, the Queen's head power, you know, power, promissory note power, which obviously we want to dismiss and isn't real and all the rest of it, but again is saying, you know, it's only for old paradigm, but the new paradigm has to magically appear because I'm not willing to pay for it, you know. Um, what ends up happening is that, that well, what I saw was all these people going into these shops and spending that little bit of power on the status or the symbol they want to make about themselves or to make themselves feel better or whatever. But what was interesting was that little bit of power they had to save their community, they were sending out of their community to never return. Because Mr. Tesco ain't shopping in downtown Nottingham. Mr. Primark ain't shopping in your community neighbourhood. And as long as we make that sacrifice of necessary evil, then we are still... 95% supporting and upholding the old. Because what we are not, no longer willing to do, and it's a really interesting thing, because we're happy to pay 
50 to 500 quid for the latest piece of tech without batting an eyelid. Okay, or maybe we bat an eyelid, we're a bit upset about it, but we're happy to pay for those things. Or we're happy to go and spend 40 quid on a new item of clothing or whatever. But if our brother or sister down the street who could provide a service that might not be as polished as whatever that you could get from big faceless company, when they want 40 quid for it, for a day of their time, we're like, nah, I'm not going to that. No, 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 it's not worth it. It's not worth it. His travel can't be more than 20 quid. He's bloody profiteering, he's just a bloody capitalist. And I'll tell you what, I've encountered that so much in the last seven or eight years of doing this that I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. Because what I'm hearing is a bunch of hypocritical nutters, basically, who are completely living a totally different story from the one that they're telling. And can we own it? Can we? I'm having to own it myself because I've been doing it. You know, I, you have a look in my bus. I've got Morrison's bags, Asda bags, Tesco bags, all the rest of it. I've got a baby there that I need to get some foods for, and often it's convenient to go and get the little purees that are already done, things like that. But all I'm doing is asking for us all to jointly assess the situation. I'm not claiming to be some kind of, you know, shining example. I'm saying, I appear to have recognised some of the pickle that we are in. <laughs> I just want to share it with you and say, can we perhaps collectively move to a close? Because individually we can't do it. It just can't be done. But collectively we can starve all of those entities we don't want in our world with just a small sacrifice. And it really is small. We might have to sacrifice the polishedness of the quality of the service that we get. But I think the amount of humanity and community that we'll be able to deliver in the space of just a few weeks by able to being turn, turn around to our brother and sister web developer or whatever it is that they do, artist or whatever, saying, do you know what? I like what you do so much, I'll have a bit. Not because I want art, but because I love what you do and I want you to not worry about food for a few days. I think it's brilliant. How many of us have done that and given 40 quid to somebody? You know, brilliant. Because that's community. Because what you're doing then is, you're keeping that money in your community. Because the chances are then, that person is going to also spend in your community. And if enough of us can share that message, then what will happen is, we will be reaching out of our community to get the spending power. But by spending it in our community, we just boost and boost and boost the power of our communities and the wealth of them. And then we can move towards a more idealistic free providence situation, but by doing it step by step where we, we become mutual supporters of each other's comfort. Totally different approach to the way that some people are approaching it now, which is, well, it should all be free. Because it's actually a lie, it's an illusion, isn't it? We've already covered that. It's an illusion. Somebody bought the tent, you know? Somebody put it into their pocket and bought the fuel. The greatest profiteer out of any festival is the government from all the fuel money. They make more money than all the organisers put together. Because what, they're getting what, 80-odd P in a litre? You know, so festivals are buzzing for government. You know, they're absolutely laughing off that. But again, just an example because it's that time of year. Um, but I mentioned the money example as one which I think is hugely important. Because in terms of the different ways and the, fr the, the, the freedom that we have to exercise our authority and our authoring of the world. There is only so much we can do with our hands and our minds, which is our unique story and our unique skill. Often, our brother and sister in the Skillshare program might not want or need our skill. That is the point of currency. The point of it is to give them the freedom and the power to go elsewhere in exchange. And if we look at it from that point of view, there's nothing wrong with any form of exchange, of any currency, it's irrelevant. You know, obviously we all know what the issues are with the system, it's to do with usury and interest, all the rest of it, blah, blah, blah. We're not going to rehash the old, the old bags in that area, but what we have to do... Week, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But we certainly should avoid the demonisation of money. And we should avoid, you know, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like saying, you know, anger is fundamentally bad, when it's not. It's about how people express anger that's bad. Money is not fundamentally bad, it's how people use it that's bad. It is a tool, exactly, exactly. It's like calling it a hammer even, just, just smash on my head with it. Absolutely, Toby, absolutely, that's exactly it. And the point is though, because people have that mindset... It's like you can make a cop and hold a baby. Like, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So because we have that mindset, and there are so many of us in the new awakened paradigm that really struggle with money, and I know there are, that's why I'm mentioning it. We struggle to trust enough that we're going to get enough. We struggle to, to, to quantify the value of our service or our art. 
It's a real struggle. I've been there for years. How do you know what to charge? It's absolutely... Yeah, go on. The financial reward for skill yeah. is so ad hoc in this country. Right? Absolutely. But, I mean, when you've got people who... We were talking earlier outside about... Um, he gets £13 an hour to sell the phone and beg for money for charities. Yeah. Where I know people who, myself included, are highly skilled tradesmen who struggle to get that from a clinic. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. building something or making something yeah. that will last forever. Yeah, yeah. Or at least for a long time. Yeah. And then you get people who can sit on a phone. Yeah. And I know most of the people who work on these yeah. sort of things, I know what they're like. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's no great skill in that. No. No, exactly. Where, where, but it's, where's the balance and exactly. the skill set? And it's about, uh, exactly, because also you've got skill versus time. Some things are not skilled, but they take ages. Mm -hmm. Other things are really skilled, but can be done quickly. It's, and and I'm not, there is no easy answer. This is why barter worked well, because it was about the value between the two parties. You agree the value between them. The point here that all I, the only... The skill you become, the quicker you can do something. Exactly. So. I mean... I really don't have the answer to that, and I think it's something we are, have to work out together with experimentation. But my, my key point in this is how we feel about the Queen's Head note, and how we treat it, and how we think about it, because we need it. Short term, yeah. we need it. To build the things that we need, that we want to build to create the new community. So let's choose to invest in it, let's choose to invest in each other. You know, we should be chucking our money at each other. I want you to have it instead of Mr. Tesco. You know, do you know, I actually used that as my, as one of my methods to stop smoking tobacco one time. It wasn't the one that finally got me out of tobacco, but one of the ones that I used for ages was, Philip Morris has had bloody enough of my money, and every time I was facing a nicotine craving, I pictured him and his family in his yacht, eating posh food as a result of killing people, you know, and thinking how much he had, I was like, and I used to cut all my angst and agitation was all directed at Morris and his kind, you know, whatever's required sort of thing. <laughs> mm. it's, a, it's, a chat, it's an outlet for the anger that's probably valid and deserved so yeah <laughs> um, but finally so I just wanted to mention that where just really really can we please rethink how we are because each of us only gets a small amount of power that's what it is look at it as power you get it so it doesn't matter what you do to get it you might do somebody's garden you might sit on a phone for whatever the point is it doesn't matter what you do to get it the ma what counts is what you do when you've got it that's what counts, you know, really, really difficult one. And again, we are, I think, I think every one of us is basically, the universe is stamping an absolute demand of mild sacrifice from, it, from each of us individually. It'll be different for each of us. It might be a bit of vice, it might be a bit of indulgence, it might be a bit of something else, you know, maybe we liked our imported apples from New Zealand from Mr. Tesco or something like that, I don't know. You know, maybe we sacrifice that for some English varieties. Whatever it is for you, it's about owning that. And that's the point. I'm not here today to dictate any methodologies other than the People's Public Trust, which I will get to. The, fi the final thing I want to mention is, uh, yeah, so necessary evils, nonsense. I don't think there's necessary evils. Um, independent shops in the city. Right. Well, Bristol is such a great example. That's the point. It's an example of what, is, what can be possible when people dig in and keep digging in. You know? I think one of the other things that sets Bristol apart, though, and here's one of the reasons why I think it does better, is because the head of the planning of the whole United Kingdom is here. And that's why actually, the, all the rules, the building regs and all the other regs for the rest of the country are written from Bristol. So what's interesting is that the policy makers here have the broader picture in mind. So when you come to them with ideas, they're open to it. They're like, yeah, 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 that, that's cool. But elsewhere in other areas, there's people who have just got the rules and regs and they're like, no, you can't do that, it's not in the rules. No, 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 you can't do that. Do you see the point there? Yeah? So they don't have the flexibility. So this is, I think, the saving grace of Bristol combined with, obviously, a very activist-based and active population. But I think any other area or any city could do as well with a more... I mean, Manchester does pretty well, but obviously they don't have the same flexibility on planning that Bristol do. But that was just another example of community working, really, and moving towards working. But uh, finally, I want to I wanna kind of... Um, just to move to a close... Is this is the kind of key to the rest of them. Because humanity without your authority is a limp biscuit. That's what we've all been enjoying, I think, up until now amongst our like-minded friends. Yeah? So we get together, there's plenty of party happens. You know, I've done many, many events through the years where party happens while we're working. And that's why the work tends to... by the close of the day, you know? 
because everyone wants to bring the fullness of their whole sovereignty to that event. And so that's not how we get things done. So the key here is, is how do we exercise this? And I, I want to return to a point I made at the beginning about entering the substance of our life, where we'd replaced substance and depth and meaning for a shallow know-it-allism of a broad spectrum of things. And our culture has led us into avoiding the situations that take us to substance, which is any time you feel that wiggle in your belly, that fire of indignation, or that kind of, you want to say something, but the hand starts to go, or the lip starts to warble, or whatever it is, whenever you're in situations like that, where you bite your tongue or you do nothing, those <laughs> are actually the invitations to substance. But our culture has told us, or indirectly, that the way we deal with that is to revisit it when we are calm, or when we are whatever. It's to say, come back later when you have clarity on it, yeah? So we don't actually deal with situations at the time which means that we don't learn a dexterous and skillful expression of our emotions and our thoughts and our feelings while we have them. And that means that we're left with nothing but outbursts. You see, you see what I mean by that? Verbalising more about... Sorry? Verbalising more. Verbalising more. Should... Yeah, no, I don't think we should be verbal. Yeah, we should be verbalising. Verbalising is one element of it. It's more about being able to stand while you feel. Yeah, I'm thinking of when I said... Real bad anger when I was a kid. Okay, yeah. And um, I think I was like 20, it was, I read uh, was it Daniel Goldman's uh, um, Emotional Intelligence. Okay, yeah, yeah, another one. He says in that, because my, my knowledge is I got really angry in front of people, or I just, like seething, like, and I was like, I don't know, do something, run away or freeze away or scream and shake <laughs> something. Um, normally I would like walk out and do the whole, oh, yeah, walk away and like, calm down. Yeah. Stuff. He says to, total opposite. Yeah. Stay there. Yeah. And sit the emotion and feel it. And that's yeah. what I did. And I couldn't believe it. I was, a, I was amazed that I was able to sit there uh, with the emotion. Uh, so I just assumed that, well, you're angry, you smack, and then you act on it. Well, I didn't. I just stood there. And I find after a, a period of time, it would actually wear off as if it was like I'm not responding to it. It's like, oh, you're not going to win. And it would just wear off. And over a period of weeks of doing this, the emotion would wear off more and more quickly until eventually it just never occurred. Mm. And I have no anger now. It's, <laughs> also, yeah, it's also about accepting your feeling. Exactly, it's about, exactly. It's about facing it because many yeah. people you mm. see when the, the way they deal with uh, their problems or their fears or their, their issues, they kind of, they leave it behind. Yeah. They forget mm. about it and they go like, no, I'm stronger than that. I don't want to think about it. You have yeah. to kind of face mm. it. You yeah. have to accept it uh, for what it is and then sort it out. Absolutely. We have, I think we have, a, we have, a, we have a, a, a false promise in our culture, again, part of the, the ongoing enlightenment, you know, the, 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 began with the enlightenment, I think, and um, I mean the socially referred to enlightenment. And I think there was the unspoken promise that if you, or allegation, uh, that if you, could, if you simply fed the mind enough ideas and you read enough books, then it in itself would deliver wholeness and completeness and connection and alignment. And it's a bit of a false promise because it can't ever deliver those things, not on its own. And this is where culture would tell us to go away and come back when we had reflected and had our mind organised to then describe and discuss how we felt at the time, which is a nonsense because it's a reflective avoidance of our feelings and dealing with them at the time. And this is the biggest point of all of this because the tempering element of all of this is to do with owning how we feel and the imperfection of what happens when we try to express how we feel. That's what puts our ego in check. When you're standing there feeling it and expressing it, that will let you know where you're really at. Now here's a, I'll just do this to finish where, you know, I, I normally do this in, in other events, but you, every one of you when you were born, you came into the planet like this, you know, and you're lying there and you're kicking and you're flailing and you're screaming and you're filling your nappies and you've got no control over your bodily functions if you were lucky enough to have a nappy. Otherwise, you're just rolling about in mess. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is, though, that at that point, you had no body awareness, but you were oozing other awareness. And with that, you, you managed to get this body to walk within about a year just by observation. OK, you just watched and you were able to do it. Nobody could show you what muscles did. OK, nobody could show you what's involved in the mechanics of this. I asked you earlier to lift your hand and say how you did it. And we don't know how. You just know that we do. We don't know how we learned that. And it took you two years to learn to make your body talk. 
and nobody shows you what you do with throat muscles and tonguey bits and stuff like that to make coherent sounds come out. So we have, we have this great respect for the, or acknowledgement in our culture of the physical journey. So when children fall, we go and we support them, don't we? And we say, oh, up you get, it's all fine, you're, you're okay, you're okay, all that sort of stuff. And we all had a lot of that to help us go from spasming about like a little loony on the floor to being able to do complex things like pick up a cup and have a little drink out of it. Took me years to master that, thank you very much. Don't you laugh at me. That took me at least a couple of years. And it wasn't easy. Yeah, and I still miss. <laughs> the point is that if we're aware, if we can get some sense of awareness, that actually, that was our physical I was referring to there, but we have other aspects which are bodies in their own right, our emotions and our mind. And what happens is when the emotions are birthed forth at puberty and that body awakens properly, it does exactly what the physical body did and it spasms. Shame, guilt, self-consciousness, all of these things. And what ends up happening though is instead of all that support mechanism we had of, oh, you're all right, it's fine. We get lots of abuse and lots of rejection and lots of other things going on so that where you are now all very dexterous and nimble with your physical body, emotionally, it might not be quite so nimble. If you picture a lot of emotional bodies walking down the street, there's a leg contraction here, there's an arm up the back and we're bobbing down. And it's not until emotion launches and it builds up enough that we have an outburst. And it's a spasm. According to that, yeah, exactly. Well, the point is, and let me give the exact example of anger, because it's a great one. Anger is the most castigated emotion of all because it gets stifled from the beginning, from when it first emerges. So what it means is that every one of you expresses anger in a different way. Whereas you might express happiness and other positive feelings in similar ways because they're socially accepted, but because anger isn't, you all have a different way of showing it. So some of you might stomp and scream and stamp. Some of you might go dead quiet. Some of you might make a crap cup of tea. Some of you might serve somebody a smaller portion next time. Only you know the little twisted things you do to express your anger. Come on, be honest, do you know what I mean? The little twisted things that we've all done to express our anger is incredible, rather than being able to stand there while we feel it and saying, I'm really angry with you because of this. We're happy enough to say, I'm so grateful for what you just did there. I'm really happy with you for that while we feel it, but with anger we don't. So what's interesting is that the same energy is anger. When you're angry, it's the same as me being angry. But how we express it is totally different for all of us. And this is where we have to, in this whole giving and taking of space, we have to get this same understanding for our emotions and our mind. And to realize that to not identify the current behavior with the energy that gives rise to it. It's merely a spasm like a baby. We may not be as dexterous in that limb of our emotion or our mind as we might like, but if we cannot give ourselves the space to be with it and to allow it to loosen out a bit and maybe flap and flail a bit, then we will never be able to move to the dexterous mastery and agility that we have of the physical form. Never. And, if we, and, and the problem that we have up until then is taking things personally when our fellows have a spasm. You know, it's actually, and now if we can start to say, oh, you had a bit of an emotional spasm there, didn't quite come out <laughs> how it was expected. But that's totally different from that bloody ignorant bugger over there, he lost his temper with me and I'm not going to speak to him for three weeks now, or whatever. But totally different when we take things personally, isn't it? Whereas if all of a sudden, all we, if we can see that all of us have the capacity to have the same level of mastery with our emotions and mind as we all do with our physical bodies, if we can but give each other and ourselves the patience and the tolerance to move to a dexterity, to at least loosen off those limbs of expression, then we will never achieve mastery. You will never achieve the healthy expression of mind and emotions that you want because our culture has pr placed a performance, a, a performance anxiety on us all where you're not to do something unless it's going to be bloody brilliant, okay? I don't want you to sing unless it's bloody good. I don't want to see your art until it's excellent. And I don't want to hear you talking about emotions unless you're really good at it. No mediocrity, no half-heartedness, no, no, no imperfect spasms, please. And that's there that stifles us from dealing with the situations as we feel them because we're afraid of looking the fool. We're afraid of our usual demeanor of the front face being compromised, which is why when we do have spasms, one of the first reactions people have is disown it. <gasps> I don't know what came over me. Oh, it must have been the booze. 
oh, it must have been the situation. Oh, it was, uh, oh, it was just that food I had that day. It must have been bad food. The person who made the food must have been angry, and therefore I took that in, and I, you know, spat it. That could actually happen, though. <laughs> I'm giving that as a potential valid excuse for some people. But anyway, um, but do you see the point? And the point being that, and the, the problem that we have, though, is that this is the movement to authority is to expressing your indignation and upsetness about a situation while you feel it, but it being safe, dexterous, expressed, and not an attack or a confrontation that gets out of hand. Because well, as soon as it gets into that, we're animals. It's fight or flight. And as soon as you do that with any authority out there, council, police, anybody like that, as soon as you start to get into fight or flight with them, then down comes, down comes the authorised use of force. Some of you may have encountered that before. But um, the point, I'm not, and I don't just mean authority out there, I mean other situations in our lives. And what I want to give you all to take away is please, please, please don't wait until a big Barney with your partner to practice this sort of loosening off of your limbs, your emotional and mental limbs to move to dexterity. Choose little situations. Be gentle on yourself. Choose a moment when maybe you get delivered a meal that isn't up to standard or somebody does say something that makes a feeling rise in you. Like you said, like you said from that book on emotional intelligence, you know, stand there in it. If it's going to come and move through, then let it move through. And if you're with somebody, just say, well, you know, I'm not very good at this, but I just have to let this come out, you know, you know and give, you, give yourself the space, create the space for your imperfection. Well, I'm afraid that my ego might kind of, you know, if I do this kind of thing, my ego might take over, I might stoke my ego. And I said, well, um, I had, you know, the same kind of fears when, I, when I've kind of done stuff. But I find that as you do these things, you experience less of it. It's like you just yeah. start focusing on what you're doing rather than yeah. worrying about how. And that's part of the same kind of thing, isn't it? Like, well, you know, not running away from it, allowing yourself to. Yeah. Um, and I think allowing ourselves to enter into the areas that we're not good at. You know, so taking on a bit of art or singing or something like that, so we can be a bit bimbling and a bit, a bit imperfect because the ego will take blows from it. You're right, the ego will be reduced by looking at our stick man and going, wow, he looks fat. What happened there? <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. But to give us, and this is again how we, all this stuff about freeing the child and empowering all of that, that's all very much part of this because that is about part of our dexterous expression. And it's part of our tempering force. It is about the humane expression of our vulnerability and fragility and having them temper the exercise of our authority so that we don't become the foot stamper and we don't become the bully. So really, these three things can weave together really simply, almost no matter what you're applying yourself to. So you can use methods, but you also don't have to. You can discover your own, you know. But if you just remember, if you are feeling power rise in you in the sense of your own righteous indignation... Just remember and temper it. Remember the other person is a human being as well and look to connect with them. And if you can do that, you've got a much greater chance of being effective. And you can have a community encounter with even the highest form of so-called state force because they're just a man or a woman like you. <laughs> I did wonder when it was coming up. I was like, is this squat being busted just as I arrive? <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. Truth juice has been had. Because like, thinking, why well, I'm going to be really late for this since we're coming in like in the last five minutes. And I was like, for the only time I come in, like, it must be for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke to him, no, he's a really, really, really nice police officer. And we had a little chat. Like, there you go. Human being. Like, like, human being. Yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah, so so that's human being. Exactly. They're all <laughs> human beings. We have to learn to see around the role. You know, we've got to do that because our authority is bigger than their role. It's not bigger than their authority as a human being, but it's bigger than their role. And if we put that in the right context, we can be effective. And that's what, I mean, those of you that have seen me talk about people's public trust and stuff before, you know that I'm always about being effective. I don't care what the methods are. It's about what is, what is required to be effective, what is required to get the best outcome here. And this is the fruits of that sort of labour. So I'm going to wrap up now and say thank you very much for your time and attention. But to go and your life itself will already be presenting you with the situations where you might get that wiggle in the belly, you might get the hand shaking a bit, you might get the lip warbling, but I just invite you to stand. 
because if you do, I see that as you using the time between now and your chosen story bubble arriving for you. You know, but just use it because I do think if we do have that systemic collapse, if you've paid attention to your authority and humanity in the interim, you will be walking out your front door straight into community. It's a virtual promise, I reckon, as long as we get our heads screwed on in the right place, a bit of honesty and a bit of maturity, and we can get there. Um, so it's always difficult to finish a talk because I can always just keep on going, so I'm not going to. It's definitely past time. I'm really grateful for all of your attention. I don't want to tire you out with any more new bits. I will say again, we are now mobile and in our van, ready to meet the needs. It's actually a bus. <laughs> ready to meet the needs of whichever communities in the country would like to hear this message or similar ones. Or if you want, like this place, now that I know about it, I want to come back here and put on a couple of weeks of workshops for people in Bristol to come to. And if there's any other spaces in other towns like this college project, then give, us, give me a phone, you know. It really isn't that hard for us to muster the cash to get fuel in the bus to come down and we'll hang out for a few weeks and have a great time. Exactly, exactly, that's it. And that's something that I'm happy to help with. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There's a space very similar to this near Lewis in Brighton called Zoo. If you're ever down that neck of the woods, check it out. It's amazing. ZU it's called. It's run by a guy called Martin. Loads of artists there. Loads of great stuff going on. If I hear about any more things, I will constantly let people know because, like you say, we need to know where we can go when we head to other places, you know, just for a bit of dose of the real. Um, in closing, because I do actually have a family and have a requirement for certain promissory note exchanges, I do have CDs and DVDs if anybody's interested. No obligation, obviously, you're welcome to come and browse. Otherwise, I'll hopefully see you at the next Truth Juice that I come to speak at. I will be at the Truth Juice gathering. I'll be doing a pile of festivals. My website, alternativeanswers.net. I didn't mention the People's Public Trust at all, but please visit thepeoplespublictrust.com or you can watch any, there's loads of videos online about the People's Public Trust. It's about dealing with police and stuff like that and dealing with councils and how you, you can maybe get them to behave. Well. Sorry? Yeah, they're, they're, the the they're all up for that, yeah. Well, anyway, if you combine what we did tonight with the People's Public Trust idea, massively effective. Yeah. So again, thank you very much indeed. Much love. messages of oppression, control, whatever, are going to continue to come and uh, we need to be ever more careful how we manage our space. Are you trying to sneak in here, small child of mine? Are you trying to crawl in under the radar? <laughs> Not only should we just walk up. Okay. So, what we're going to be, um, the last thing I want to say before we begin is, if we haven't already begun, is about this idea of truth. And the fact is that there's tons of truth out there. You can go on the net or the web and you can get, jack yourself up on as much truth as you like and read as much of it, watch as much of it as you like, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it can get you nowhere. Because just because something is true, it doesn't mean it's important. It doesn't mean it's relevant. I mean relevant to you and your future. And it doesn't mean it can take you anywhere. And I'm only interested, I've been surrounded by so much cack in my life, I'm only interested in that stuff which goes somewhere, it's important, it's relevant. Because I'm, you know, all of us are bombarded so much, surely we should start to have a bit of assertiveness over what we want to fill our minds and the spaces of that with, you know, and what stories we want to be repeating. And so I want to try and always use the time that I have with you, however short it is, to try and just stay on what's important and what's relevant. And tonight's distillation is, I think, very important and relevant for anybody not just interested in the sovereign or the free man movement, but anyone interested in finding out how they can move to express themselves more confidently and in a more empowered fashion in their life. Um, and I, it's, it's such an important point because I want everybody to just, it's such a cliche, but it's going to happen, so you better all do it. I want you to turn around and look at everybody in this room. You don't have to make eye contact, you don't have to do anything like that, you don't have to introduce yourself, I just want you to look. None of them bite, no, there's no monsters yet, it's all right. Okay. Did anybody see anybody that looked like them? Did you see anybody that looked like you? Hmm? 
No. Did you see anybody that dressed like you? No. No. So why is it we're all so transfixed on looking to others for some idea as to what our story might be, as to what our truth might be, as to what message we may have to bring? Because we all do it a little bit. That's part of that seeking aspect within us. But we're at a time now, I think, where it's a time for us to own it. I think we're going through a massive space initiation. I'm not going to talk about that just now, tonight. But, um, you know, a massive initiation of can you own your space? Can you, can you actually manage the integrity of your boundary? Uh, it's a very significant thing because for most of us, you've been confident enough to wear the clothes that you want for most of your life. You've been confident enough to wear your hair in the style that you want or have facial hair or not for the guys, whatever it is. But how many of us actually have the confidence to speak the truth of our unique interpretation of things? How many of us allow the truth of our being in our story or what we may have intuited or sensed in our life? How many of us allow that to... Sp this is part of the problem. As a species, we've never been presented with... I mean, we all take them for granted now, but computers are the most multifunctional tool humans have ever had placed at our disposal. Everything else is generally just for a few things. A screwdriver is for screws. You can't hammer things with it. A hammer is for nails. You can't screw things with it. Same with most of the tools that we're used to. But computers are something you can do a whole bunch of things with. You ever find yourself sitting in front of a computer going, what am I going to do? You know, just staring at the screen. You know, have you ever been there? Exactly, that's what I mean. And I think as a, we, we should recognise it and discuss it because it's a discipline that we have to learn. You know, it's a tool that's taking more of our time than it should do. And rather than being the fisherman and the spider, we become the fish and the fly. And we become jacked up on the story. We then vent our emotional content and our depth and our substance into it and then not go out and do stuff. Have you ever done that? Where you just feel better because the forum's got it all. It's like, oh, I feel better now. I feel like I've done my bit. You know, and actually that passion and that verve and that fire that you felt is actually spent. You've you know, spent three hours crafting your post or whatever it is or making your little video and sending it out there. And I'm not saying that's not a good thing. It obviously is. But I'm just suggesting we need to revisit the balance of these things and check in with our excitement fix and our story fix. Uh, because one of the common threads in all of these stories, every single one of them, from Benjamin Fulford to Ascension to Aliens to Comets to Solar Flares, is that you don't have to do anything. Every single one of them is about it being taken out of your hands and somebody else or something else taking care of it. And actually, this is actually, I discovered that uh, I stumbled upon this kind of, a name that I worked a lot in mental health and I have a name for this complex and it's actually Messiah Complex. But it's the other side of Messiah Complex. We're all familiar with the first side of Messiah Complex where you've got people like David Icke or Bill Hicks or Terence Trent Darby who have had awakenings and actually renamed themselves the Messiah in one way or another or thought that they were or made the statement publicly that they were. That is the, the version that we're familiar with. The version we're not familiar with is the other side of Messiah complex, which is where we're waiting for someone else to do the work and save us. We're waiting for someone else to bail our community out. That is Messiah complex and is no different to walking about thinking that you're Jesus. It's no different, it's just the other side of the coin. One is the one thinking they're going to save and the other one is waiting to be saved. And I just invite you to consider which one you might be because one might be better than the other, I'm not sure, you know. Which is better, a whole bunch of people sitting about waiting for Jesus or a whole bunch of people thinking they are him? You know, <laughs> you choose, you know. That's it, but it's a really interesting thing and again, it really ties in to this net and web effect because if we can go in there and we get our high and we get our fix, we can feel a little bit better up against the backdrop of all the other news, which, all these other stories, which are supposed to be enlightening and awakening, but can often have the hidden undercurrent that you might not consciously notice of making you feel powerless and helpless, or making you feel impotent and actually unable to do anything about it. And that is the double-edged sword of alternative media, where one side is like, yeah, all this truth, all this juice, you know, 